Well, good morning, everyone. Good to see everybody. And I did agree to come down here and speak, but got, I thought that I was going to have some decent weather. But <laughs> can't have everything. We got sunshine right now, which we're thankful for. And we have a warm place to stay warm and stay out of the cold. So we're, we're thankful for that. It's interesting that Scott has been writing about Joseph over the last, I think, several letters that have, that have come out, the Friday letters. And just a, just a tidbit of um, interesting information, this, this last week and this week the, began the Torah readings about Joseph in the, uh, in the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis, Genesis I think it begins in 38, and then this week they're, they're reading about Joseph in Egypt as a, as a slave, and then he becomes elevated to a position of great power and prominence. And we know the story from there, that he reconciles with his brothers, his father comes, and God talked to Jacob, came to him in a dream as he was traveling to Egypt. And he told him, I'm going to, don't be afraid to go to Egypt. I'm going to multiply you and make you into a great nation. And I will bring you back up from there. So right there in the very beginning of the story of Egypt, or of Israel going into Egypt, God told them what he was going to do. That they were going to go down and, and grow into a great nation. But then he was going to bring them out. And God does that in the book of Exodus. And we're told that it was done in a supernatural, powerful way. Let's go to the book of Deuteronomy and read just a little bit of this, of the story of what Israel experienced as they were brought out by God out of Egypt. Deuteronomy chapter 4, and we'll read... starting in verse 34. And he's talking about that God brought them out, and he says, Or did God ever try to go and take for himself a nation from the midst of another nation by trials, by signs, by wonders, by war, by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, and by great terrors, according to all that the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes? To you it was shown that you might know that the Lord himself is God. There is none other besides him. So here they are, they're immersed in the supernatural. Darkness, lightnings, hail, various insect plagues. And at the end, at the Red Sea, they see God's great power as he parts the sea. And they walk through on dry land. They came, and he brought them out, and he brought them to Mount Sinai to tell them something very important. They came to hear the voice of God. Let's go read a little bit about this voice before we continue. If we go over to Psalms 29, we're told about the voice of the Lord here. Psalm 29, and we'll, we'll begin reading in verse Three. when I get over there. Some of these scriptures I have in my notes and some I don't. Some I just put the reference down. Psalm 29 and verse 3. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The glory of the God of glory thunders. The Lord is over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Just imagine a large cedar tree just splintering. And he goes on to say, the Lord splinters the cedars of Lebanon. He makes them skip like a calf, Lebanon and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord divides the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. And in his temple, everyone says, glory. Glory. That's the voice 
that Israel heard from the mountain, from Mount Sinai, as they were brought by God out. I just want to note down, I forgot to write this down, the time. And we're told in the book of Deuteronomy that Israel came to God, Deuteronomy 5 and verse 24, as they were hearing this voice, they came to Moses, actually, and they asked him, make this stop. We can't continue to hear this. Deuteronomy 5, this is the retelling of the event. Deuteronomy 5 and verse 24, and you said, this is speaking of Israel, surely the Lord our God has shown us his glory and his greatness, and we have heard his voice from the midst of the fire. We have seen this day that God speaks with man, yet he still lives. Now, therefore, why should we die? So they, they were living, but they were afraid. They were thought, thinking, we can't, this can't go on. For this great fire will consume us. If we hear the voice of the Lord our God any more, then we shall die. Full of fear by this event. They had seen so many supernatural things that led up to this unique time that God brought the nation of Israel. By this time, maybe a million or so in, in population, and he brings them to the mountain, and he's, what does he say? What does God use this opportunity to tell them? I think most of you know the answer, the Ten Commandments. We're not going to go through all of them or even try to attempt to address any of them in this message, but we're going to talk about them and the importance that God shows us that they have to him by the commentary that he inserts himself into these commandments as he's giving them. God told the nation of, Israel, of Egypt, he told Pharaoh, allow my son to go, let my son go, that I may talk to them, that I may speak with them, and that they may worship me. God here reveals to his people his love language. And many of you have probably seen the books that have been written. Many books have been written by uh, a gentleman named Gary Chapman about, I think it's called The Five Love Languages, and then there's multiple versions of that theme, The Five Love Languages for Your Kids, and just various uh, takes on that. But God here comes to the mountain of Sinai, and he gives Israel his love language. In Matthew 12, we're told, if you can write this down, Matthew 12, 34, that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. God here, in a spectacular display of power, reveals his heart to Israel. Let's go to Exodus 20. Exodus 20, we'll begin, we'll just read a little section out of, out of here. Exodus 20 and verse 1. Exodus 20 and verse 1. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. It doesn't begin with thou shall do or thou shall not do. It begins with a declaration. I'm God. I'm your savior. I brought you out. I broke the power of Pharaoh over you. You didn't have the strength. You didn't have the strength to come here. I brought you. So here we see God revealing his grace, his loving kindness poured out on the nation of Israel. Because of his grace and his mercy, what does he ask for? What follows? You will do these commandments. Because of grace, we are called to obedience. The opposite message of mainstream Christianity. They believe that because of grace they can disobey, that there's no obedience. But God sets us free through his grace, so we do this. 
Deuteronomy 6. Deuteronomy 6 and verse 20. Deuteronomy 6 and verse 20. When your son asks you in time to come, saying, what is the meaning of the testimonies? Referring back to the Ten Commandments, the statutes and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded you. Then you shall say to your son, we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And the Lord showed signs and wonders before our eyes, great and severe, against Egypt, Pharaoh, and all his household. Then he brought us out from there, that he might bring us in to give us the land in which he swore to our fathers. God's grace, again, is extolled here. God brought us out when we were weak and powerless. And he, what did he do? Verse 24, and the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is this day. Now let's go back to Exodus 20. Go back to Exodus 20. You may want to even just put a little marker there so you can get back there quickly. Exodus 20, God goes on and gives them the first two commandments followed by some commentary. You shall have no other gods before me. Verse 4, you shall not make for yourself the carved image any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, here's the commentary, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands and many feel that that could mean thousands of generations if you interpolate it from the verse above. Third and fourth generation for punishment, but mercy to thousands of generations. To those who love me and keep my commandments. Here we see God's heart in his words as he says, this is my love language. This is how to speak my language of love. Keep my commandments. So if we betray God, if we abandon him and his commandments, there will be consequences, as he points out. <coughs> consequences potentially to the third and fourth generation. But Satan wants you to believe that that is false. That there will be no consequences for you to walk away from God. That you can ignore his clear commands, and not suffer. This statement should capture our attention, that God will bring punishment. He will visit the iniquity upon you and me if we disobey. Sin is not worth it. Temporary pleasure. Remember the story of Moses that we're told and we're given this information in Hebrews 11 that he saw what was happening in Egypt as a temporary, that he could have given in to the temporary pleasure of sin, but he chose not to. He saw something greater, something more eternal that he walked toward. Now, is this, only, is this only given in the Old Testament? Is this only, many will say, okay, this is old covenant. This is all old stuff. Why are you still believing that? God threw that away when Christ came. Well, let's Let's go to the New Testament. Keep your place in Exodus 20. Keep your place in Exodus 20 so you can kind of refer to it. If I had a slide, I would put them both up on the slide, but I, I don't, and I wouldn't want to um, complicate Gail's life <laughs> any more than it is by having a slide. So let's go to Ephesians. Ephesians 5, and, and let's just look at verse 1. Here, Paul begins talking in this chapter, and he says, to them, be imitators of God as dear children. And then he begins to talk to them about all kinds of things that they should not be doing. Basically, commandment breaking. And then at the very end, in verse 6, of, uh, not the end, of, in verse 6, he makes this comment. 
Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God, remember what it said in Exodus 20, visiting the iniquity upon the third and fourth generation, because of these things, the wrath of God becomes upon the sons of disobedience. Does that sound like it's out of touch or out of similarity with what we just read in Exodus 20? doesn't sound like it to me. Paul goes on to say the same thing to the Corinthians and the Colossians. Let's just look at one verse out of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians 6, and we'll read verse, verses 9 and 10. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 9, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves. Now, what, what is all the theme? What's the theme of this? Sin. Nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. The message was consistent. We have to hold on to God's law. We have to hang on to that importance in every life, in every day, every day of our lives. So we, we just read that God brings wrath. And the New Testament is consistent with that message, that there is wrath, there is a penalty for sin. And many who try to say otherwise are going against a clear, the clear verses of God, the, the clear message that God gives us in his word. Isaiah wrote this in Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 20. He says, to the law and to the testimony, or to the Torah and the testimony, referring back, testimony usually refers back to God's commandments. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. There is no light if they are going against what God says clearly in his word. They take us into darkness. They take us away from God. Exactly what Satan wants to do to all of us. Satan wants to deaden the sorrow of sin. To deaden our godly sorrow. To make us think, oh, that, that's not a big deal. We, we can we cannot, uh, maybe not keep the Sabbath. Or if I tell this little lie over here, it's not a problem. God understands. Yeah, that's what Satan wants you to think, that God understands. But that is not the case. God's way is a light, and it's something we have to be using every single day. Now, we know that nobody, myself included, has kept the law perfectly. We all know that, except for one man, Jesus Christ. Now, let me ask you this. Because we fail, and every one of us does, because we fail at keeping the law, should we stop trying to keep the law? Because we sin, should we then keep on sinning? Let's go to 2 Timothy 2 and verse 19. 2 Timothy 2, 2, Timothy 2 and 19. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of Christ do what? Depart from iniquity. Romans 6, verse 1. Romans 6, verse 1. Paul asks, asks this very question. What shall we say then? Romans 6, verse 1. Shall we continue in sin? Shall we keep on sinning that grace may abound? Certainly not. Or as the old King James says, God forbid. How shall then, how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? And then Romans 8, if you just go over to uh, a couple of pages to Romans 8 and verse 4. Here we're given, in a sense, the formula for how we do this and how we perfect this. As I said, no one, no one will ever be perfect. There is only one man. But we can move the needle. 
Romans 8, verse 4, that the righteous requirement of the law might be what? Fulfilled in us. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. God wants his law fulfilled in us. And he wants us to see that law as his heart, as his opening himself up to us and saying, here is my heart. Not as a curse, not as a burden, but as God's language of love. So we're told here that the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. That component is there to help us, to strengthen us, to give us the power we need to do this. It's not, it's not done away. Our covenant with God is the same covenant that the nation of Israel made. Drop down to verse 13 in this, in this uh, chapter. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Now let's go back to Exodus 20. Exodus 20 and bring out another point in this commentary from God himself. We see God showing us his mercy here as well. We see that he says consequences to the third and fourth generation in verse 6. But mercy to a thousand generations. So what is God's heart? God's heart is that he doesn't want to bring punishment. So he only brings it to the third and fourth generation. But he wants to show mercy. He wants to show mercy. He wants to show mercy to the thousandth generation. He's reluctant to bring judgment to the wicked. He wants them to repent. And we're told that several times by Peter, that God would want all men to come to repentance and have a share in his kingdom. This is his heart. He wants to show mercy and shower his love on those who repent. That's our love language. God speaks our love language here. He says, I will forgive you. I will show you mercy. That's the love language all of us need to hear, every human being. And the biggest lie that Satan will try to tell us is that God doesn't love us, that God doesn't see value in us. Because if Satan can sever that connection, he can deafen our ears to what God is trying to tell us. Now let's look at God's love. As I said, we talked about God's love. He says very plainly in verse 6 that he shows mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. So as we've already covered and talked about, God's love language is that. He's saying, love me and keep my commandments. So what does Satan try to do? He tries to convince every Christian that there's no need to keep the commandments. Many Christian denominations will tell their, their, their followers, their believers, their members, you're rejecting the grace of God. If you believe you have to keep these commandments, you're rejecting God's grace. Well, in fact, they're rejecting God's language of love. They don't understand this is the way God wants to be loved. Many will say, and I've even heard this, some, some say this in our, in our church, you know, they, they're afraid that we're becoming pharisaical. They don't, they don't want to be Pharisees. You can't earn your salvation. They minimize the weight that God places on his commandments. And the enemy, our enemy Satan, will do everything he can to disrupt the truth about keeping his commandments. We've already talked about that it's not our own power that does this, but it's important to God. In fact, it's salvational. 
You keeping, you and I keeping the commandments is salvational. The, the phrase that many Christian denominations say, which is that you don't have to keep God's commandments. What they're actually saying by that term or that phrase, you don't have to keep the commandments, is you don't have to love God. Now imagine putting it in that frame, many of them would reject that idea. I love God. I love God. But do you understand how he wants to be loved? We know that many people are going to come to Christ at the end of the age and say, Lord, Lord, I, I did all this. But he's going, to, he's going to tell them, get away from me, you who practiced iniquity. They're not, they didn't understand his love language. So God reveals his heart to us through his words from Mount Sinai. Reveal the heart of the Lord. And when we hear about God's laws, what's our reaction? Is our reaction, oh, that's love. Is our reaction, that's wonderful. Or is our reaction, oh, really? Do I have to do that? Do I have to stop working on Friday at sunset and not work until Saturday at sunset? Do I have to not steal? Do I have to do all these things? Our reaction should not be, as it points out in Romans 8, Romans 8, verse 7. Paul talks about what the carnal mind, how the carnal mind reacts to God's commandments. Romans 8, verse 7, because the carnal mind is enmity or hates the Lord, as it says in Exodus 20. The very same language. The carnal mind hates God. For it is not subject to what? The law of God, nor indeed can be. Only the humble in heart, those who have faith, and we understand that it is faith, that it's not a legalistic keeping of commandments, it's faith. It's faith in Jesus Christ. It's faith in the power of the Holy Spirit in us. Those who have that will submit themselves to the heart of God, his law. Let's look at Exodus 26. If you want to go back there and keep your finger there, and then from there, let's compare Psalms 103 and verse 17. Psalms 103 and verse 17. Exodus 26, I'll reread it again. But showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. Exodus 103, 17, but the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and, and his righteousness to children's children, to such as keep his covenant, and what to those who remember his commandments to do them. God's grace is followed by the expectation of keeping his commandments. Now let's go to the New Testament, John chapter 14. John 14 and verse 15. John 14 and verse 15. Here we have Jesus Christ doing something that is, in a sense, mind-blowing to me. And what he says in verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. Here he takes ownership. He takes ownership of the words he spoke on Mount Sinai. And what's the result? What will happen if we do this? Follow on to verse 16. And I will pray the Father. And he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. So Christ here is quoting from Exodus 20 and verse 6, and he's taking possession of those words. My commandments, he says. And the result of that, verse 16, blessing, the honor, the benefits, the Holy Spirit, and that Jesus and his Father will dwell with us. 
Now, Satan does not want that to happen. That is the last thing he wants, is that Christ and his Father would abide with us. So isn't it interesting that he has convinced most of modern-day Christianity that they do not need those laws that Christ spoke at, Ex at Mount Sinai in Exodus 20, that they are not binding or relevant to them. In Acts 5.32, if you just want to jot this down, I'll read it. This is what something the apostles told the Sanhedrin. Acts 5, verse 32, And we are his witnesses to these things, and so also is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Following on by to John 14, 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. We will abide with you, and the Holy Spirit will be part of that formula. Matthew 19. Let's go to Matthew 19. Matthew 19 and verse 16. This is a famous event. Many of you have read this. And a young man comes to Jesus Christ and he asks him the million dollar question. The question at the top of everybody's mind at certain points of their lives. In verse 16 he says, Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do? that I may have what? Eternal life. He's asking him about, how do I have eternal life? And Christ responds and he says, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. But if you want to enter into life, so he says, okay, here is the answer. If you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. And he said to him, which ones? And Jesus makes it very clear which ones. He begins to recite several of the Ten Commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So what good thing shall we do to enter into eternal life? As God spoke to them at Mount Sinai. He says the same thing here. Keep the commandments. Our obsession should be to keep God's law every single day so that he will abide with us. He and his Father will abide with us. The commandments are all about love, as we've seen. It's God's love language to us. What are the benefits? Let's look at some of the benefits that are given to us in the scriptures of keeping God's commandments. Do we want these? 1 John 3, verse 22. 1 John 3, verse 22. And whatever we ask, we receive from him, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. So you want your prayers to be answered. Do you want to know that God is going to listen when you are on your knees in your prayer closet or in your car or wherever you may pray, do you want to know that he's going to listen and that he's going to answer? <coughs> well, here is how we know. If we do those things, if we keep his commandments and do those things pleasing in his sight. Psalm 34. Psalm 34, verse 15. Psalm 34, verse 15. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. So God will hear you if you are keeping his commandments. And one of the other benefits, we've already talked about this, is abiding in the love of Christ. John 15 and verse 10. John 15 and verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. 1 John 3.24 also relates to this. 
abiding in Christ. 1 John 3, verse 24, Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. This is the exact thing Satan wants to disrupt. He does not want you or me abiding in Christ or him abiding in us. He wants to sever that connection. He wants you to believe that you can get away with a, a commandment that maybe you don't want to keep, maybe a sin here or there, a white lie here or there. He wants you to make you to believe that that's not that important to God. So he can sever this. He can sever your connection. Another benefit that Christ talks about is that we'll know the truth. We'll know the truth. This kind of follows on from the previous point. John 8, verse 31. John 8, verse 31. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word. So again, we're talking about abiding in Christ. You are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So that's another benefit. We'll know the truth. How important is the truth to each one of us in this world today? Most of us probably never would have thought we would get to the point where objective truth is questioned at the level that is questioned today. That we don't even understand simple science, simple biology of male and female, and to the point where some are questioning simple math. Simple math. Math is racist. How can a number be racist? Explain that to me. It does not make any sense. Proverbs 2. Proverbs 2 and verse 6. Proverbs 2 verse 6. For the Lord gives wisdom, and from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk uprightly. So as we hold on to God and his way, we're also going to know the truth. We're also going to have truth. Let's go to Psalm 119. I think we sang this in one of the hymns we just did. Psalm 119 and verse 97. Psalm 119, verse 97. Begins like this. Oh, how I love your law. Notice the relationship in their minds, that there was love and law. They loved the law of God. It is my meditation all the day. You, through your commandments, here's another benefit we get from God's commandments. Make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. Do you want to be wiser than your enemies? Wiser than our chief enemy, our adversary, Satan. Study and keep God's commandments. I have more understanding than all of my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients, because I keep your precepts. So we're given wisdom. We're given the ability to understand more than our teachers. We're given the ability to be wiser than our enemies. Do you want to be filled with God's Holy Spirit? We've already kind of covered this in some of the previous verses. Let's go to John 14. John 14 and verse 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. Again, notice the theme. He who has my commandments and keeps them. Are we confused about what commandments he's talking about? I think many modern-day Christians are thinking, Oh, these are just some, these commandments are just some of the platitudes that Jesus talked about. These are just some of the, maybe his parables or something like that. It's not the thundered words from Mount Sinai in Exodus 20. I think Christ has made it very clear in other places what he means. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Now drop down to verse 23 and notice the progression. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, 
and my father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. And how is that done? Let's go down to verse 26. Verse 26. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, it will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. So do you want these blessings? Do you want to abide? Do you want the Holy Spirit? And as we've already talked about it, do you want eternal life? We covered the verse in Matthew 19 where the young man asked, Jesus, how can I have eternal life? And his answer was, keep the commandments. So we've talked about answered prayer, abiding in Christ's love, knowing the truth, wiser than our enemies, wiser than our teachers, filled with God's Holy Spirit, and eternal life. So how are we doing? How are we doing on this journey? How are we doing on speaking God's language of love? Let's go to 1 John chapter 2. And so we'll do a little bit of an audit. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 3. We're told this. Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. How many people will say, do you know the Lord? That's what they say to you on the, on the street. Or have you given your heart to Jesus? They have no clue what that means. They have no idea what they're saying. Those who embrace a Christianity that teaches disobedience to God's law are being taught to embrace a false Christianity. That is a false worship of Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 2. Let's go to Revelation 2. Here Christ is speaking to the church at Ephesus. And he begins to talk to them. And, and overall, it begins very positive. You've done a lot of good things. But then down in verse 4 of Revelation 2, he says this to them. Nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. Therefore, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works. What? Wait. Works? We have to do works? We have to repent? What is he saying? What does repent mean? Most of us, I think, understand repent means stop doing what you're doing, turn around, and go the other way. And do the first works. So there are works involved. Or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place. Ooh, doesn't that sound scary? Is it once saved, always saved? Or is it, I will come and take your lampstand out of its place? Unless you repent. So God speaks our love language. And he wants us to speak his. He is telling us, I will be merciful. Turn around, repent, and do the first works. And love me by keeping my commandments. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, God says this to, to Moses. And this is after the event where they said, stop this voice. We can't handle this anymore. And God says to Moses, to Moses, Deuteronomy 5 and verse 29. Oh, that they had such a heart in them. God is after our heart. He has opened his heart to us. That they would fear me and always keep all of my commandments. That it might be well with them and with their children forever. God is not wanting to punish. He does not want to bring iniquity, bring the iniquity onto the third and fourth generation. He wants to be merciful. And he wants to see people flourish. 
that it might be well with them and their children forever. That's his desire. God was looking for their heart, and he opened his heart to them. So we need to fear and obey our Father and our elder brother, Jesus Christ. God has spoken to each one of us. He's spoken to each one of us. In the love language of mercy and forgiveness. And he wants us to speak to him in his love language by keeping his commandments. As a son or daughter of God, our lives must be centered around the pursuit of loving God with all of our heart, all of our mind, and all of our soul, and keeping his commandments. Join me as we finish, as we conclude in prayer. Father, we, we come to you so, so grateful that we can talk to you, that we can worship you, that we know how we should honor you and show our love to you. And that you've shown your love to us. You've opened your heart to us. You've given us mercy and grace. And you've made very small demands on us for that mercy and grace to keep your commandments. We're so thankful, Father, for all you give us, for your mercy, for the plan you've laid out and given through your holy word. Help us, Father, to, to hang on as this world disintegrates around us, as truth falls to the ground. Help us to hold on, Father, and hold on to your words and hold on to your commandments. And Father, we're thankful to be here to, enjoy, to have the food that's been prepared for us. We ask you to bless our meal, bless the fellowship we'll enjoy on your Sabbath day. And we pray you'll be with all those who are still meeting. We pray for Joe and Laura as they will be keeping, they'll be having a service in an hour or so from now. We ask that you just be with them, guide and direct all that's done. And we give you thanks in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen.